Welcome back to New Record Day. My name is Ron, and in this week's episode of Tuesday Tech Talks, Danny Ritchie of GR Research. Oh, man. This is a good one, folks. We are going to be talking about the difference between in-room measurements and speaker measurements, and you better believe it, there is a difference, and Danny does a great job of explaining what is the difference and why it matters. Enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another Tuesday's Tech Talk. Today we're going to be talking about speaker measurements and room measurements and what the difference is between the two. Um, it's one of those things where there's a lot of confusion about it and I get emails from a lot of people often sending me a measurement that they've taken in their room and they, they're telling me here's the measurement of my speaker, look at the speaker's measurement and try to help me diagnose what the problems are with the speaker. Uh, first question I always have to ask is, is this your left speaker or your right speaker? Because I only get one measurement. And then, of course, the response is, that's both of them playing together, which is completely wrong. And that's not a measurement of your speaker. That's a measurement of your room. And it's an improper measurement of your room. Um, when you measure your, your speaker in your room and you're looking for a room response of that speaker, uh, at the location you've placed a speaker in for primary listening. In other words, you've got it set up properly and you put the microphone near the listening position. You have to measure just one speaker at a time. Let me illustrate. Here's a couple of little full range drivers. So let's say you have speakers. This would be on your left. This would be on your right. And you're sending them a mono signal. What's happening is you're getting reflections from the walls you're getting reflections from the ceiling. You're getting differential time arrivals from each speaker if they're not perfectly timed in time with the uh, microphone, in other words, same distance. So you're getting uh, arrivals of signals that are later in time versus other signals. So what does that do? That causes them to be uh, in phase and cause a peak, or it can be out of phase and cause a dip. So what you're doing is you're complicating matters by sending multiple signals and you're getting reflections from different positions and you're getting a response that's not your room response it's the effect of having two sources playing a mono signal at the same time that's not even how you listen to your music typically you'll send it a stereo image in other words the, the uh, or a stereo signal in other words the signal you're sending to the to the right speaker and to the left speaker are often very different you know, some things are the same some things are designed to be the same from both speakers and to try and voice center imaging and things like that. But typically, uh, it's different. When you're sending it a mono signal and doing sign sweeps or uh, an RTA or anything like that, um, you're just looking at the uh, cancellation and the peaks and dips that you get from two different sources. So what you have to do is look at just one speaker at a time. And you may have a side wall on one side and the speaker, and you're going to have a reflection off of that side wall that could either be a peak or a dip. It could be a wavelength behind what's coming out of the main speaker, but it can either arrive in time or out of time. In other words, the wavelengths are either going to be in phase and they're going to couple and cause a peak, or they can be out of phase with each other and cause a dip, you know, a big suck out of the response. So then you have to correct it by treating that wall. You'll have to put something on it to soften that reflection so that the reflections in the room are somewhat even. You don't want a reflection that's causing uh, a peak in one area. I know a lot of you guys out there would like to think that you could fix all this with some type of room EQ, uh, like EQ room EQ wizard or something like that. Uh, that doesn't work. That, that does not solve a room reflection problem. Uh, what those things do is it will take, um, let's say you got that peak uh, from a sidewall reflection and at the listening position it's picking it up and it's showing it as a peak. And so what its response is or what its solution is, is just to take everything in that frequency range and turn it down so that the amplitude at the listening position is more balanced. And that may seem like a good idea, but that's not solving the problem. You're still hearing the reflection from the wall. 
that's not supposed to be there. You're not supposed to hear the reflection from the wall. You're trying to create a three-dimensional sound field and you need everything to be even in, within the room. If you're hearing something hotter in one spot of the room than another and you're, you're hearing reflections from the ceiling or from the walls, those are doing things to the imaging in the, in the soundstage layering that, that's disruptive. It's not fixing it. So just turning it down in that area doesn't solve the problem. The next problem that you get into with trying to EQ the room like that is that even though you've got your microphone set in one spot and you've tried to EQ each speaker, as soon as you move over a foot, now the time arrival of that peak that you were toning down is delayed in time such as that the wavelengths are no longer in phase of making a peak. Now that reflection is causing a dip because it's arriving out of phase, so you have a hole there. So now that peak that you tried to take out that was 3 or 4 dB too hot, now that same area has a dip in it because you moved over just a little bit and now there's a hole and now you just made the hole deeper. So the whole room EQ thing really is a band-aid. It doesn't work. There's no substitute for real room acoustics, um, absorption and diffusion to help with the, the entire sound stage and to give you an even overall room response. Now some of those devices can help down low in a lower frequency range just below 200 where things are more omnidirectional where you may just have a heaviness you can take some of that heaviness out uh, or if you have a dipped area somewhere you can try and lift that up. You can get some benefit down in the lower frequency ranges but up top, no, it doesn't work that way. So all of these things that we're talking about now, these are all room measurements. They're not a measurement of your speaker, it's a room measurement. It's just as much an effect of the room as it is the output of the speaker. So what do you have to do in order to give me or to see an actual speaker measurement. Let's take a look. Uh, we're going to walk into the room here and look at a speaker that I have set up and I'm going to walk you through what we do in order to measure the speaker and get speaker only measurement. Let's take a look. Alright here I am on the back side of the camera again showing you what we've got set up here. We've got a microphone sitting in front of this Klipsch RP8000F that someone sent to me so I can measure and test it. Uh, the microphone is one meter away. It is on tweeter axis. And we've got the speaker elevated up off the floor so that the tweeter is near the middle of the room. So that the room reflections are as far away as possible. So there's the setup. Now let's take a look at what it does. Alright, here we are with the measuring system. We're looking at the impulse response. I'm going to shoot a new one. You'll get to hear how it sounds when we take a measurement. Sure, you could hear that. And this is the initial response reaching the microphone. Uh, we see here there's multiple time delays in the response. There's a different delay in the woofers versus the tweeter. The tweeter's offset behind the woofer some. Uh, and then we're seeing some some uh, basically some noise through this area. What it's doing is that's stored energy. Uh, it's it's not settling very fast there's a few little peaks going on and then it starts to settle and then out here we're seeing a reflection here you see this line way out here that's the reflection from the ceiling and uh, it's causing that little squiggly line there now so if we look at the measurement that we just took it looks pretty rough all this all these squiggles here and bumps are from uh, room reflections so what we want to do is we want to knock that out of it we don't want to see reflections. so when we measure a speaker we do what's called a gated time window so what we do is we set a start in this, in this instance we're starting at three milliseconds that's going to be the starting point we just gated away everything that arrived prior to that and then we're going to come out here let's say seven milliseconds away or at seven milliseconds so we get a four millisecond window and we're going to gate that out so we're just looking at the impulse response right here and we're gating it out far before we get to um, the reflections in the room. So this response is the exact same response that we would get if we were in an anechoic chamber. And I used to have a large anechoic chamber. And now if we go back and look at the response, we see all those jagged lines are gone. We see a much smoother response. Now what we're also seeing here is um, we're seeing a pretty 
pretty horrible response to be honest. We're seeing a huge dipped area here where the the uh, tweeter and the woofers aren't even reaching each other in this design. Now the reason I know that they're not reaching each other, I shot before just the woofer response only and let's see here and this is just the tweeter response only so neither is reaching the other. Uh, normally we see these um, reaching over into the others range a little bit better and then we see them summing. Now what we're getting here is we're seeing that the drivers are 90 degrees out of phase so they're not summing at all. So I flipped the polarity uh, on the tweeter and it's summed back a little bit more. It's still a hole so that was probably not 90 degrees out of phase it was probably a hundred and 10 degrees out of phase and it's 70 degrees out of phase if you flip it the other way around so the crossover was designed such that it didn't allow the drivers to blend very well uh, looks pretty bad uh, that's a horrible response uh, it was this is one of the models that was sent to me to upgrade this was definitely going to take some some work and try to do something different on this to try and get these responses to blend um, We'll see what I can do with it, but that's what we do when we take a speaker measurement. We're looking at the frequency response um, taken from an impulse response, and we're gating the room out. So when, whenever you're sending me a measurement, if you're not sending me a gated time window, then we're really not looking at a measurement of the speaker. We're looking at a measurement of the room because you're taking into account or you're allowing all of this stuff to be in the measurement and if we zoom out a lot more we'll see that there's actually a lot of stuff going on all of this is room reflections all of that settling time all of this roughness here all this roughness here all of that is part of your measurement when you take a in-room measurement the only way to look at just what your speaker is doing only is to gate that stuff out of it you have to take some type of software that allow you to do a gated time window and you have to set a start and you have to set a stop and there we are back where we were and now we're just looking at a speaker measurement only that's the difference between a speaker measurement and a room measurement if you have questions throw them out there in the comments section that's it for right now I've got a speaker I need to do some upgrading on and design something for it to get these drivers back in phase and make this thing work more on that next week. Have a good one.